But in my view, you know, this is a constant theme in American life of corporations. What they are is creations of state law. We the people decide what a corporation is. A corporation doesn't exist in nature. It exists because we the people, through our state legislatures, decide we're gonna have a corporation law, and then we define what a corporation is um, and how you can do it. You have to, you know, we wanna start a business. We could do it today. Um, but if we wanted it to be incorporated, we'd have to file something in Augusta, comply with the corporate laws, and then we'd get the benefits. It's a, it's a privilege. Um, and you know, you'd get things like limited liability, you get um, the ability to have you know, contracts signed in the corporate name to sue and be sued. All those things are creations of law because the early revolutionary era, they knew that there's a danger of corporate power. It's a privilege from the state, but you, you give privileges, and if you don't keep an eye on them, they can you, you leverage, into, uh, leverage economic might into political corruption. Um, so if you look at, you know, what did the framers think? You know, the, you know, James Madison, who wrote much of the Constitution, said corporations may be a necessary evil. Those were his words. But only with proper limitations and guards. So the idea that James Madison meant freedom of speech, the people's freedom of speech, to include corporations is preposterous. Um, James Wilson, one of the first Supreme Court justices, also a signer of the Declaration of Independence at the Constitutional Convention, um, said the same thing, that they, corporations may be useful tools for economic activity, but they must be subject to inspection and only uh, allowed with very great care of the people because the founder's experience was the East India Trading Company. Um, that tea that was thrown into Boston Harbor <laughs> was a corporate monopoly that the English government said you gotta buy from the Eng East India Trading Company. Um, and so you know, they had, had personal experience with corporate power. Uh, in those days. Um, Thomas Jefferson, he was always more colorful, right? The, uh, the tree of liberty must be watered with blood every 20 years, that kind of talk. He said um, you know, that, that he would crush in its birth the moneyed aristocracy of corporations which dare already to challenge our government. Those were his words about the Bank of the United States Corporation. Um, so you know, this is a theme that goes all the way back to the framers. Um, and then in the progressive era, the last Gilded Age, I think it's a lot like our own. You know, remember the turn of the century, the railroad corporations, the, every industry had, had its concentrated power and great, great in the sense of big and huge corporations. There was the Sugar Trust, the Rockefeller Oil Trust, that every, every industry had essentially concentrated into corporate power, and they were corrupting our government. Um, senators, which were appointed back then, not elected, were basically appointed to represent corporations. Corporate cash was more or less handed out on the state legislative floors to decide what, who, who would go to Washington to serve in the Senate. Um, and, and that's when the first sort of corporate person idea got pushed into our Bill of Rights. And the people pushed back. We forget that sometimes. You know, We want to say, oh, this has been going on for 100 years. No, it's been going back and forth. People pushed back. The Progressive Era, they did four constitutional amendments in 10 years. But then we had a, a close to a century of corporations more or less in their proper place. They were always, you know, powerful. They always will be. A big industry, I mean, you know. But they were not considered rights holders like, like Citizens United thinks they are. Um, and and there's, there's many cases from the middle part of our 20th century where the Supreme Court's very clear that corporations are instruments of the state, they're creations of the state, and the people have the right and maybe the duty to regulate them properly, to make sure that they don't hurt the public interest. They exist because the states allow corporations to exist to serve the public interest. Now, how did that change? Well, my um, remember Earth Day, April 1970. Um, April 1970, 20 million Americans came into the streets. 20 million, I mean, can you imagine one day, 20 million Americans into the streets, and if you look at the pictures, you'll see, maybe some of you were there, you'll remember, it was not sort of a 20 million radicals, so maybe some radicals, but there may be also conservatives, a lot of people in between. It was a, you look at the pictures, it's mainstream Americans with their kids, with their, you know, just all kinds of different people um, coming out. Now why? Um, well, although the law said we could regulate corporations, they had resisted any kind of environmental regulation. Rivers were catching on fire. Uh, you know, the, um, 
Air was so toxic in places uh, that pe people were literally dying. But the toxics and the, and the environmental damage was uh, so extreme that I think Americans knew we can't go on like this, literally. We, we will not be able to survive. <laughs> and, and that's what Earth Day was about. And the response, you know, we've, we're used to our democracy not working very well. Think about the response to Earth Day. Within a couple of years, literally, we had the first Environmental Protection Agency created. And this is with Richard Nixon in the White House. Environmental Protection Agency created. Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Endangered Species Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Toxic Substances Act, the Superfund Act, I could, Eastern Mountain Wilderness Act. I'll run out of fingers if I go on. It was a massive restructuring of the deal, of the deal between you know, corporate power and the public interest. But Lewis Powell, back in 1971, wrote a memo to the chamber. He witnessed what happened on Earth Day. Uh, he was appalled. This is, it was entitled, Attack on the Free Enterprise System. That was the title of the memo. And the corporations had to organize, that it was no longer enough for one corporation to fight these isolated fights. Corporations had to organize together to fund for as many years as it took to change, he said, the legal, economic, and social structure of America. And that's an ambitious goal. Again, six months after he wrote that memo, he was appointed to the US Supreme Court. And within a period of six years, Justice Now, now Justice Lewis Powell, writes four decisions in six years that created the corporate speech idea. Um, the very first one was in my now home state of Massachusetts uh, called Bilotti versus First National Bank of Boston. Uh, we had a law in Massachusetts that said corporations shouldn't spend money to, to defect the outcome of those if they don't have anything to do with the corporation. So if it's a referendum, say, about in personal income tax, which is what it was, whether we should have a progressive income tax or not, Corporations are not allowed to spend corporate money in that referendum. Um, the executives could spend their own money, shareholders could spend their own money, but the corporations weren't allowed to under our state law. Uh, Bank Boston, Gillette, and Digital Equipment Corporation said that violates our constitutional rights, our free speech rights. And the Supreme Court of Massachusetts said, what are you talking about? Corporations don't have the same rights as people under our constitution. They lost. They appealed to Washington, to the Supreme Court, Lewis Powell wrote a five to four decision saying they won, and it was the first time in 200 years of American history that a law intended to keep corporate money out of elections was ever struck down and, uh, on a theory of corporate speech. And Lewis Powell wrote the decision, but more importantly, getting out of the sort of legal history to the impact of it. You know, we still don't have a progressive income tax in Massachusetts here 30 years later. Um, and you know those, those corporations that were so concerned that uh, their argument was about why they had to spend money to stop a progressive income tax? In their briefs, they said, well, we won't be able to recruit top executives to Massachusetts <laughs> if there's a progressive income tax, so it does affect our corporate bottom line. Well, let's see what they, we, they won. We didn't, we, our, our law was, not only was our law struck down, we don't have a progressive income tax. Let's look at what those great executives, presumably they were able to now recruit in Massachusetts, were able to do. All three of those companies are gone. Um, Bank Boston merged with Fleet and then with, and then with Bank of America. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. Each time, thousands of jobs were lost. Each time they merged, literally thousands, I think 15,000 with Bank of Boston. Each time those thousands of jobs were lost, the CEOs made an absolute fortune. Um, I think it was over 60 million for the Bank Boston and Fleet mergers for six CEO salaries, 60 million. Because that takes us from 1978 up to what's so different now, how that could happen. Um, so, th and that's the link to, you know, corporate power taking our constitution, striking down our laws, and disabling our ability to have something like a progressive income tax and resetting the table so that the, the corp, not only the corporations, but those who control them have a massive inequality of power that we're not allowed to do anything about. The Supreme Court speaks, it, it forces people to think about, you know, can we live with that? And that's what Citizens United is. It's, we've had 30 years of this erosion of corporate power taking over our country, and C Citizens United proclaimed it to the nation. So the change is happening across the country. We have millions of people have signed amendment resolutions that we put up to say, you know, corporations are not people, money is not speech, constitutional amendment, Congress, get on it. Um, th th these resolutions that call for a constitutional amendment to reverse it are fantastic organizing 
vehicles. 300 towns and cities across the country have passed these resolutions. Uh, so we've got Boston, New York, LA, um, big, big cities, small towns, all in favor of this amendment. Um, six states. We've got a thousand business leaders now on board and a co-sponsor. There's basically two problems if you think about the amendments. Corporate power, corporate personhood as some call it, and the money, problem of unlimited spending. And there's amendment bills that get fixed both of those. So that I think is the litmus test I would ask you to say. Not to let, it's okay if they're in different amendments right now, it just, but, but you want your um, constitutional amendments, the, the um, combination of them or together to address the, you know, the Sheldon Adelson billionaire spending problem and the Monsanto you know, corporate rights problem. Um, we have to fix both of those if our democracy is going to go forward.